week, I'm continuing my look at works of licensed fiction based on tabletop games with the first Dragonlance novel, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. When I first read Dragons of Autumn Twilight back in middle school, I hadn't read much fantasy fiction, and I definitely hadn't watched much anime. This year, I decided to revisit the Dragonlance trilogy with what I now know about fantasy fiction with a more pers mature perspective and as a reader, and having watched, according to my anime list, at least 66.5 days worth of anime between when I discovered anime in middle school and now. Possibly more than that, actually, definitely, definitely more than that. The first book, in a way, starts off in a cliched fashion, but in a very self-aware cliched fashion. A group of adventurers meet in a bar and are kicked out of the door on the road to adventure. In this case, the adventurers are a band of heroes who have mostly known each other for years, who left to travel the world because they suspected that there was some weird shit going on, and returned with the answer, I don't know, but there's definitely some weird shit going on. Those heroes are Flint Fireforge, a dwarfy dwarf, Tannis Half-Elven, a ranger with dice slice, Sturm Brightblag, a kinda lawful stupid paladin slash cavalier, Tasselhoff Burfoot, a kinder thief whose player really wants to play the comic relief, Karaman Majir, a fighter with good constitution, strength, and charisma, but not much great anything else, and his brother Raceland, a mage who rolled 18s for intelligence and wisdom, and 8s for everything else. They are kicked out the door following the arrival of two barbarians, Riverwind and Goldmoon. The two have obtained evidence that after the gods left the world grand centuries before in a cata great cataclysm, the gods are now returning to the world. The existing theocratic governments consider this a threat to their power, and the forces of the goddess of evil want to cover this up because they don't want people to know the goddess of evil is back yet, or at least that there's an alternative. Rereading the book, I found in my mental pictures of the characters that they fit more easily into sort of anime-inspired portrayals. Much of the humor in the book comes from characters either doing something dumb and being corrected for doing it, or characters getting into silly situations and reacting to them in a comedic manner. In several other points in the book, I found myself kind of, in my head, thinking up omake strips for the story, with little four comas with the characters reacting to comedic circumstances, or thinking about how it would work as a sort of Dragonlance abridged webcomic. As an aside, if that doesn't exist, it totally could work. It should work. Maybe someone could get on that. The writing is generally okay, but it gets a little male gaze at parts. Admittedly, this happens when a PV POV character is male. On the other hand, you can have a male character describe a female character who they're attracted to without getting into describing their boobs and thighs. On the other hand, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman have some of the best dragon descriptions and internal narratives in the business, of which I mean internal narratives for the dragons. Each of the dragons we encounter in the story are absolutely terrifying, killing their victims in a manner that, to continue the anime comparison, would fit in nicely with a late 80s or early 90s OVA or film. Now, the characters in the book are two-dimensional, but not in a bad way. They don't have the character depth as the characters from Game of Thrones, but they fit well into archetypes, and archetypes can sometimes work to help the reader know their way around the work. That said, it's where the writers go with those archetypes in the second installment that really decides how the series goes. To use a, the Star Wars comparison, by the end of A New Hope, everyone is still a fairly stock archetype. It's Empire Strikes Back, where the characters go into new and interesting directions. I definitely enjoyed reading the book, although I recognize this is the literary equivalent of a popcorn movie. It's not going to challenge your sensibilities, but you're going to have a fun time while you read it. Now, if you're interested in picking up the book, it's available from Amazon.com as a paperback, Kindle book, unabridged audiobook, or as an annotated anthology with the other two books in the trilogy. I own both the audiobook and the annotated trilogy. Both are definitely worth picking up. The audiobook is very well done, and the annotations in the collected trilogy are really enjoyable to read. Links to those will be in the show notes, and buying anything through those links will help support the show. Next week, I have one more regular review of the month, 
And so, again, since we're continuing with this theme of books related to tabletop role-playing games, I'm going to be covering a biography of Gary Gygax. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.